And welcome back to Jeff Koinange Live, the home edition. Working from home after testing positive for COVID-19 some nine days ago. Here, along with Dr. Frank Jenga, he knows a thing or two about mental health. Now throw in some covid and it's an explosion waiting to happen. By the way, Dr. Ari, a lot of people are tweeting tonight saying, is this guy sick? He doesn't look sick. Am I supposed to be on an IV drip in an ICU or in a morgue for people to realize I have COVID? What is wrong with people? Um, I think people, again, Jeff, I'm, I'm, I'm some, I think it's bad news. Maybe it's good news. People are just people. People are just normal people. Um, until they see uh, somebody, their friend or neighbor, or um, and we saw this. Those people are old enough to uh, to remember uh, what happened with respect to um, HIV/AIDS. Until uh, your cousin or your sister or your nephew or or, or even your wife or husband um, got infected and was diagnosed, it took years and years. Um, for people to understand that um, that the HIV was a reality in and around our community, number one. Number two, um, until a tr treatment, effective treatments were found for the condition, uh, people lived uh, and existed um, in what they, uh, they preferred to be state um, of ignorant uh, bliss. So, I, I think it's probably too much to expect that everybody will believe everything that they are told, true as they are. I have seen people saying uh, of you, Jeff, and uh, Gerald Teach and other people, ah, those people are oh, Melipo Pesa. Um, it cannot be the case. But what they don't know is that um, more than 80% uh, of the people who get infected um, with the coronavirus are completely asymptomatic uh, like you, Jeff. Now, they've heard me say that, but they will immediately forget that tomorrow, uh, expecting that how can he be uh, COVID positive and he's still looking very strong? Uh, well, there are many reasons why uh, some people get symptomatic and others don't get symptomatic. But I think one of the things that government needs to emphasize, to repeatedly state to the people, is that 80% or more of the people who test positive are like you, Jeff completely asymptomatic. The reality, however, is that even though uh, one is asymptomatic, i.e. without symptoms, without cough, without sneezing, without fever, uh, they are still passing on the virus um, to other people. Uh, and, and I think that's a message. And I think those of us who are in medicine, those who are in the media, need to keep pushing this message, um, even uh, as people seem not to believe us. I think eventually, uh, when we say it uh, enough times, uh, some people anyway uh, will believe us. And I wish more people would wear masks uh, because really masks have been shown all over the world, um, even in America with Trump, uh, that they are effective and they reduce uh, transmission. And they also reduced the number of viruses uh, that one who has been infected is able to push out uh, to his fellow colleagues. So um, I, I think it's a question of time and people will believe the truth that um, the virus is here with us. Um, and, and really, it's only a matter of time uh, before a large number of Kenyans eventually um, get infected with it. You know, I'm glad you mentioned that, Doc, because people are probably walking around, have no clue that they have this virus and are going about their daily business. And I'm glad you cleared that fact that 80 plus percent of people recover from this thing. And people are, you know, they, they look at the 20% or the 2%, according to experts, that, you know, this thing will really affect them and some might die. Maybe people are waiting for more people to die so that they can believe it. I don't know. Anyway, let's, let's switch gears, dog. Domestic abuse during COVID-19 has been on the rise. Tell us about this. Well, I think the first thing that um, one needs to say about um, domestic violence is that it's there, it's real, um, and it existed uh, before um, COVID-19. What COVID-19 has done is to make a difficult uh, situation that much worse uh, for the reasons that we alluded to earlier, which is the fact that um, we are all uh, going through extreme stress uh, visited upon us 
by uh, by this close proximity, the absence of uh, social and uh, fuses that ordinarily we would use to to, to ventilate um, our stresses and anxieties about things. Um, and therefore, rather than um, express our anxiety by um, hitting a golf ball or playing basketball or football or just talking boy talk or girl talk and uh, praying and, and, and all the things that a human being used to release uh, the anxieties, and all those things have been taken away from us. And we are now uh, in a pressure cooker type situation. Uh, in relation to our relationships with our loved ones. And we express it very sadly um, through um, domestic violence. I'd like to say this, however, that I have actually seen um, groups of people um, that are in anticipation um, of almost the inevitable um, situation of being in a pressure cooker, um, getting into corporate uh, wellness programs. There are institutions that are, uh, are helping uh, people to actually talk. Um, in, in fact, I did a talk exactly like that this morning uh, to a group of men, actually, um, who um, who felt that they were the subject um, of um, potential um, domestic violence situations. And we discussed with them uh, some of the strategies that uh, men could get in, into uh, to try and, um, and anticipate um, this this very difficult. So it's possible to look out for institutions that give what is called psychological first aid, um, so that um, you you talk about it and you prepare for it, and you get uh, given the strategies um, of, um, of of avoiding uh, being either the the perpetrator or the victim um, of domestic violence. So accepting that uh, we have. Um, uh, the situation tragically um, that portends to its development and anticipating that um, we can do uh, something about it. Uh, we are not um, helpless bystanders. Uh, we can actually actively anticipate how we could prevent some of it by psychological fast aid type techniques. What if you live in the in the cities, Dr. Ari? What if you are confined to that one room house there's six or seven of you, and you can't stand each other anymore. What do you do? Um, I, I think first is um, the, the first thing that one must do uh, when you find yourself in a difficult or challenging situation is to acknowledge where you are, that this is difficult. And depending on um, the relationship that you and your spouse had before COVID-19, Jeff, let me tell you again, it doesn't really matter whether you live in a one-room uh, house or, or a five- or six-bedroom uh, mansion, wherever it is that you live. Um, the, the, the challenges between human beings are very similar. Uh, strong bonds and good relationship between spouses are what will eventually help people uh, survive and go beyond uh, these unbelievably uh, difficult times. Um, I'll say this again, and I'll keep saying this. Uh, we need to, to get out of, uh, of the closet. Uh, we need to confront our spouses and say, Mimi, kusema ukweli na si uongo inanisumbua sana. Na wewe je, ibe kupeleka wapi. Let's talk about it. That's how the pressure cooker uh, releases uh, the valve and the pressure uh, goes away. Uh, and I'm, th I'm, I'm grateful that you've asked me to come here tonight. Uh, just if I don't say anything else tonight, is for goodness sake, let's talk to each other about our fears and our anxieties. Because Jeff, you know, and I know, that all of us, without exception, uh, have a measure of anxiety uh, associated with COVID-19, whether it's financial, whether it's emotional, psychological, uh, economic, uh, a possibility of infection of ourselves or our parents. All of us are in that boat and all of us need to talk about it with somebody. Start with your spouse. But at the same time, we are such a paranoid people, Dr. Ari. You test positive, everyone is fleeing. Nobody wants to be associated with you. You heard Gerald Teach there saying that some people who are going through other people who don't want even any contact with her? 
There are some people um, who I call who won't pick up my phone. They'll think they'll get it through the phone. I heard you talk about one of those ones, wearing masks. Uh, but I, I think uh, we're expecting um, too much of a change in people too quickly. Remember, actually, yeah, the COVID-19 seems like it's been with us for centuries. In fact, in the broad scheme of things, this is a completely new phenomenon. Um, and it, it, it's come, it's a total stranger. It's changed the way we do business, the way we live, the places we work with. Look at you doing uh, J JK Live from home. I mean, look at me doing this from home. I mean, our lives in its totality have been changed by invisible um, intruder into our lives. So the fact that people are still doubtful um, it is, 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 is the way people learn things. I think we need to be patient not only with ourselves as individuals, but also with our societies and their communities, um, because this, 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 um, in, in the broad scheme of things, uh, six months uh, at, the, at the outside, uh, in fact, it's not even six months, it's more like five months, is a very, very short time to expect fundamental changes uh, in the behavior and conduct um, of, of a people who are used to a different type of life. I, I would advocate that we be patient, and I like what your teacher was saying. It will, People will change. People will understand. People will accept that masks are important. Sanitizing is important. Social distance is important. Keeping away from um, kissing each other in the middle of the night with a combi full of our, uh, of our bodies in, uh, in nightclubs and bars. Uh, we will come to understand that. Uh, I think we continue to talk to our teenagers, talking to our young men. Um, and, and I think uh, eventually the, 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 the correct message um, will get to us. But then finally, Jeff, and I think this is critically important, I think um, there has been a shortage until now um, of good news, of recoveries, people who have tested positive and are doing well and are continuing to work. Uh, people like Jero Teach who have got symptoms uh, but who look really good and are able to... What we need um, more of, Jeff, are more positive stories because there are actually more positive stories than sad and tragic stories. And the numbers of case fatalities as opposed to the number of people who have been infected uh, tell that story very clearly. And I think that is the story we need to tell, that we have a very, very dark cloud around us, but there are silver linings uh, about the number of people who are completely without symptoms and about the, num the large number of human beings who eventually uh, get better and go back to work. That is a true story. That is a story I think that, Jeff, we need to be telling. Um, um, yeah, that, that, that's what I think. It's a good story. Well, very well put, Dr. Ari. But listen to this. There's a woman on Twitter the other day who said she doesn't like wearing a mask because it's not allowing her to show her beauty. And then there's some young men who complain that they are no longer able to admire beautiful ladies. Jeff, if you allowed me, I'd like to laugh a little bit because um, I, 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 I really, <laughs> I cannot understand how um, when one exposes themselves to death, um, they expect to enjoy and experience uh, beauty. Um, we, we know this, that um, ultimately some people um, will die and will be unable uh, to appreciate beautiful girls. Um, the girls will be unable to, to show off their beauty to, uh, to whoever they would like to show they are beautiful. Uh, but, and, and, I, and I'll keep pushing this, the good news, that day will come when a vaccine um, or herd immunity or effective treatment will allow all those who will be alive then, um, only those who will be alive uh, post the vaccine and post herd immunity will be able to show off uh, their beauty. So I think together, collectively, um, our first duty and responsibility to ourselves and to our loved ones and to our fellow citizens is to keep safe and to be alive um, after that. And we will all be able to show off, uh, well, those who can and those who are, beauty <laughs> <laughs> okay. Dr. Ari, let me ask you this uh, is there enough information getting to people out there because for instance if your loved one is sick in an ICU 
You can go anywhere near there. You're in the parking lot of a hospital praying, hoping for the best that this person doesn't go. Is there enough information being relayed to people out there? No, not at all. I, I think, again, and this is uh, the reality of it, this is a new beast. This is a new animal that has invaded um, our territory. In fact, I was saying earlier on that the worst job one can do today is be president of a country like ours because it doesn't really matter what the president does. You look, you're a bad man. You open, you're a bad man. Um, you give information, it is inaccurate. You don't give information, you're being unfair. Government is actually in a very, 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 very difficult uh, situation, be partly because uh, nobody has been in a situation like this. Doctors, uh, poor doctors who are treating uh, this condition are in a very similar uh, situation. The only way to protect uh, families and relatives from a person who is emitting the virus is to create a physical barrier uh, between themselves um, and the loved one who is unwell. Now, we know because we're human beings that the time you want to be closest to a member of your family is when they are unwell, and much more so when there is a danger of fear that that person uh, could pass on. That's when you want to be close to them, you want to hold their hand, you want to tell them sweet things, you want to hear their last words. Um, and there are the doctors who are saying, no, 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 no. You can't do what normal people desire to do. You must keep away from the one you love the most. Uh, because if you don't do that, you will get infected yourself and you could also pass away. So um, the reality is to keep safe uh, the doctors, uh, the medical workers in general, not just the doctors, nurses, the world, and everybody else, I uh, tell you to do that which is unnatural uh, of human, human beings, which is to keep away from those that you love at the most critical and crucial moment um, of their lives. So, Jeff, um, those who say government is not giving us information, um, doctors and nurses are not giving us uh, information, they are right. They are not giving enough information, except that the circumstances do not allow for any more information that is available. And sometimes that information is simply not available. It seems like government is keeping it away. It seems like doctors and nurses are keeping it away. And in reality, it's because they themselves don't have information. We have a stranger in our midst. Uh, she's in, or he's invisible. Um, and, and really, these are very, very difficult and testing times for government and for our medical practitioners. And all I would urge those of us um, who are citizen is to exercise a, a measure of patience and understanding and tolerance uh, for those who are working uh, in extremely uh, difficult times. Yeah, Doctor, you nailed it. You're damned if you do and you're damned if you don't. When you hear cases in the U.S., close to 150,000 people dead, Brazil is crazy, India, Europe could be having a second wave. When you look at us here at this moment in time, are we doing the right thing? You know, Jeff, I was asked uh, recently a question that I'm a bit shy to answer uh, <laughs> because it was, it was actually very, very interesting. It was a question about uh, what lessons, Jose, have you learned um, about this COVID-19 situation? And I had to say the truth. Uh, which is that I, one of the big things that I have learned um, is the importance of having a good government, a, a government that has policies, a government that has structure, a government in a sense um, that is responsive um, to the situations. I look at some um, governments around us, I look at Brazil, I look at the US, and I say to myself, these people um, are, are suffering in the way that they are suffering uh, because they have not believed their scientists. One of the things that um, I, I have noticed uh, through, throughout the five months that uh, we have been here is that our government, very interestingly, has involved, uh, and I know this for a fact, um, medical uh, epidemiologists, virologists, and other experts at every stage um, of the response to, to this pandemic. And I hope our government continues uh, to listen to the wisdom 
um, a knowledge of the virus. Oh, by the way, sorry, Jeff, I nearly forgot this. Um, the other thing that I have learned, which is also true, is that there is a very large number of extremely clever men and women, doctors um, of all sectors that are available uh, to help us. So our government ha cannot possibly score 100%, but our government has done uh, reasonably well um, in a very, very, very difficult uh, situation. Has our government listened to our, to our doctors every single time? Of course not, uh, because I think that sometimes government has to make political decisions. We as doctors make uh, primarily medical decisions, and sometimes the two uh, propositions uh, do not find confluence. Therefore, I think um, uh, in answer to your question, specific answer to your question, um, I think our government has responded uh, reasonably. Um, and, and I think as long as it continues to listen to the experts, um, I think uh, in spite of the rising numbers, um, I think we are working as reasonably good uh, teams. I'm glad you mentioned the doctors and the nurses and the frontline workers, Dr. Ari, because you all are literally, you're on the front line and a lot of healthcare workers are testing positive. So they need to get credit where it's due. All right. Okay. I've given us, uh, our government many, many, many marks um, in the last thing that I have said. But in the initial stages um, of this response, I think, uh, I don't think we panicked. Um, yeah, I nearly said we as government. I don't think we as a country panicked. I think what, what happened, uh, Jeff, is that we were all uh, unsure as the as to what is the right thing to do, and there was and it was not just Kenya; the, the whole world uh, was unclear and uncertain as what to do. And I think uh, when historians write about COVID nineteen and the national response uh, to COVID nineteen, one of the things that historians will find us guilty of, I think correctly, is the fact that we did not um, put enough measures uh, to protect um, our medical workers. Um, quickly enough. Because remember, without uh, these frontline uh, medical workers, um, the population uh, becomes the frontline. Um, and, 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 and the virus will attack this very weak uh, link and position. So it, it is true that uh, the, 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 the government did not respond quickly enough uh, in the early stages. But again, historians uh, will make record of the fact that the whole world uh, was suffering from uh, a, short, a severe shortage of protective equipment. The whole world was suffering from a severe shortage um, of, uh, of testing kits. Um, but nonetheless, um, I think um, it is true to say that we have not given all the care that we could have given uh, to our frontline uh, workers. Uh, but I think now just listening to, um, to some of our colleagues, the situation is improving. It's not perfect yet. Um, there is still um, more that we could possibly do. You couldn't possibly do enough uh, to protect um, this army of very, very de dedicated and extremely clever uh, group of uh, young uh, and some not so young doctors. Let me say this to your viewers, Jeff. Uh, you can go to sleep uh, in the comfort and knowledge that Kenya has extremely good and competent um, doctors in this country. That is the second thing that I have learned uh, from this uh, COVID-19 response. Absolutely. Well said, Dr. Ari. Well said. Let's go to our viewers' reactions, if we will. On Twitter, Carly says, great conversation with Dr. Ari. She says, even I can't recall the last time I wore makeup. Unfortunately, I have to wear masks and goggles for hours at work. Our health comes first. COVID-19 is real. Winnie Mitula says both Jeff and Jerotich remain in self-isolation. Their media appearance is encouraging to those suffering in silence, including those under quarantine waiting for test results. Good luck, Winnie if you're in quarantine right now. Dr. Tari, someone else was asking, um, what do you do to kids who are addicted to the internet? What do you do with them? How do you deal with them? Addiction to the internet actually existed before COVID-19. Poor COVID-19. I think wherever uh, this virus is sitting, 
it's sometimes being blamed for things that it has not done. That it has made worse a lot of things is also true. So um, people who um, who are addicted to um, to the internet and to gambling and um, uh, to all these computer games um, are probably at greater risk of accentuating uh, those symptoms. And the reason for that, Jeff, um, is because of the higher risk that is associated with the fact that uh, people are at home. Um, the children are not going to school. I mean, you know, I sit here um, as, a, as a grandfather uh, pontificating uh, about what uh, 10 and 12-year-olds um, uh, should, should be treated. Um, and, and, and please forgive me for, for pontificating. Uh, but the reality is that being away from school, school actually is an incredibly important part of the lives of children. Um, and it's not children don't just go to school to learn uh, maths, history, and geography and things. Children go to school to learn how to socialize and how to be with uh, with other human beings. Um, so when children are locked up um, in, in, in in at home uh, with very frustrated and angry uh, parents who are on the verge of um, um, pushing uh, violence at, at each other. The only um, thing that children turn to is, um, is, is, is their mother's phone, their father's phone, uh, the television and whatever it is. So, Jeff, I think we must judge um, our children and their, pa- and their parents um, gently because really, truly, uh, the circumstances that we live in um, are almost prescriptive um, of the perfect environment for the development of what appears like, well, like addiction. But let me say this. Uh, because it's also true. Because this virus will go away in time, uh, children and their parents, let me emphasize, are very, very resilient people. And we will defeat this virus. Children will go back to school and normal life will resume. So I think uh, let us not forget that the virus is a visitor, a very inconvenient, almost nonsensical visitor, uh, we will suffer some inconvenience. We will uh, do some things that we should not do. Uh, but when the virus has gone, we are a very resilient people. In particular, children are very resilient indeed. Uh, some scars will be left, but at the end of the day, I think uh, we'll be left as a, as, a, as a normal people. Amen to that, Dr. Ari. We cannot wait to see the end of 2020. What a year. Wanja Douglas on Twitter says, Dr. Frank Jenga is a gem of knowledge and such a sound man. Key lessons, we must tolerate each other until we win. What a Dr. he is. Dr. you get the last word. Go ahead. Talk to Kenyans. Talk to our people. Um, this I have to say to the people of Kenya. We have um, a very serious and a very, 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 very difficult situation. Don't let anybody lie to you that they have experienced anything like this ever uh, in their lives. I was trying to say that uh, maybe maybe uh, this guy called Noah, the one who had an ark um, and did things. That's the only time I know uh, that the whole world was affected by a catastrophe. But since Noah, this is the next time the whole world um, north, east, west, south has been affected um, equally. It, the fact that you're a rich man, a rich uh, woman, the fact that you're born to royalty by uh, Queen Elizabeth herself, you British prime minister, the fact that you live in, uh, in a slum, we are all equal before this democratizing demon um, called uh, COVID-19. My advice to all of us, first of all, is to be patient because we shall defeat it. And secondly, and I think equally importantly, is to try to the extent possible to comply with the laws and regulations um, of the land. We will only be able to criticize our government um, when we are alive. So I think we owe it to ourselves, we owe it to our fellow citizens uh, to stay alive um, until the vaccine is found or until herd immunity is achieved. But in the meantime, we don't have a choice uh, other than to wear masks and wear them properly. Cover your nose um, and mouth. Um, wash your hands. Uh, keep social distances. If you like kanyuaji, wait kidogo. When the virus has gone, 
uh, you can go back to your usual habit. My final word there for Jeff is uh, let's stay safe and we'll have a drink another day. Absolutely, Daktari. I couldn't have said it better myself. Let's stay safe and have a drink another day. Dr. Frank Jenga, as always, I could listen to you every day, all day. Thanks so much for your time. Great pleasure, Jeff. Great pleasure. And stay safe and um, we'll see you again soon. Absolutely. God willing, Daktari, God willing. Thank you. Dr. Frank Jenga there, nailing it, calling it like he sees it, folks. And thanks so much to all of you. By the way, there's a guy called Andrew Joe who was asking, have you read all those books behind you? Yes, I have. And by the way, I have a confession to make. There's no way I could have set up all of this without help. This, come on. So, Gregory Juma, thank you so much. Samson Kibashia, hooked up the IT and everything. Monica, Monica and the team. That's why I have this thing in my ear, folks. So I could go live and we can come to you. Jeff Kinange, home live home edition. And of course, coach. Thanks for having faith in me, man. Day nine, tomorrow, by the weekend, get tested again. And next week, if it's Wednesday, it's all about those three letters on the keyboard that follow each other. J, K, L. Thank you for all your thoughts, your wishes, your prayers. I'm getting so many messages, little kids, old people, and everyone in between praying, wishing for the best. I appreciate it. Thank you so much, people. God bless you all. Stay safe, sanitize, wash your hands, social distance. Like Dr. Frank Jenga said, we'll have that drink another time. Speaking of drinks, where's my lemon and garlic and ginger? Good night, good luck. God bless you all.